Savior with us. Would you stand as we do just that? I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was a Till I met you.
Hey, welcome everybody to NCC Online. I'm so glad to be with you today here, and I'm glad that you're tuning in. Thank you for doing that each week. We are finishing a series called When Necessary, but we're also, in a sense, carrying it on by a two-part look at the gospel. And before we do that, I, I want to let you know that um, we have these really cool wristbands, which you probably can't see, but if you can't see it, so they say when necessary. So we're giving these out on Sunday. And if you're here uh, um, in person, we'd love to give you one as well. Just check that out at the Info Center it, as supplies last. Just a way to have a higher level of commitment. This is a little token, but wearing this, I, I feel, is a way of saying I accept the challenge in 2022. Not a challenge from Rob or from NCC, but really from Jesus himself of the Great Commission to go and make disciples. And when necessary, we use our words, we share, we invite, and we ask um, the Lord to help us in that process. <clears throat> so I, I hope that you, um, with or without the wristband, take up that challenge in 2022. But this morning, we want to jump into the gospel message itself. We decided to do that in, in, in two parts, the bad news first and then the good news. And, of course, the reason why you do that is nobody wants to hear the bad news last. You don't ask someone, hey, do you want the good news or the bad news? And they say, well, go ahead and give me the good news first. No one in the history of the world has ever said that, I don't think. Everybody wants to hear the bad news first. And when it comes to sharing the gospel, it's the same. It starts with the bad news. Now, the word gospel in the Bible actually means good news. So in a sense, it's all good news through and through. But the way we need to speak of it, it starts with our condition. It starts with uh, our hearts. It starts with the way things got broken. And then it moves, of course, into redemption. And so our plan is to hit this over two weeks. Today, again, the bad news. And then next week, the good news. That means you don't want to only tune in today. I really hope that you make a commitment to listening to the good news. It would be a shame to just hear part one of the gospel message and to end right at this pivot point. You're, you're going to feel a lot of tension in that. Uh, the reason why we're sharing this in such a direct and clear and concise way is, is really twofold. One, if you've never trusted Christ before, I'm so thankful that you're willing to give a little bit of time online today. Thank you for leaning in. Please keep leaning in. Uh, please don't turn off uh, th this recording. Instead, I, I would just ask you to have an open spirit as you hear the tenets of Christianity. It's sort of the 101s of the gospel, if you will. That's just the core of what Christians believe in a salvation sense, the most important part about us. A and hopefully, if you've heard it before or even if you haven't, you would be able to sense God in it. And, I, and my prayer for you is that you would receive Christ, that you would commit your life to him. And of course, it's a very personal and very serious decision, but I hope that you'll at least uh, give it a listen and, and maybe even pray that God would speak to you and see what he does. But for most people, I think the reason why we're sharing it is in the sense of our series, When Necessary. We want to get better at sharing our faith. And we want to do that in relational ways. We want to do that with our good works. We want to mainly do that with our love, but we want to do it when necessary with our words. But some people feel like, I don't know the words. <clears throat> so this series, I believe, will give us some of the words. You don't have to think of it as a memorized presentation, but at the same time, I believe it'll be really important to sharpen our ability to clearly say what the gospel message is. And the other thing I wanted to let you know before we jump into it is I took this outline from an organization called Dare to Share Ministry. So I wanted to give them credit for, just for the outline. But the outline is really cool. It's one that I hadn't used before in sharing the gospel. But I think it's really, really helpful because it's actually an acronym for the word gospel. So think of the word gospel, G-O-S-P-E-L. And each of the letters are one of the tenets of the gospel. And we're going to look at the first three this week, the bad news, and the next three, Lord willing, next week, the good news. And in, in, in doing so, we really cover the bases really well. So I hope that you commit this to memory. I, I hope that you try to learn this approach. I hope that you remember these six letters. It's, it's actually not that hard to remember, and that'll help you. It'll freshen your spirit 
in terms of your own sense of the gospel and the good news. And I, I know for me, it's been extremely encouraging to review this, but also we'll really give you a good outline in case someone asks you for the hope that you have. So here's the um, picture. You can see it behind me. If, if you want to you know, take a screenshot if you want while this is up here so you can you can see it, you can have it. Maybe you even want to memorize it. Again, that's completely up to you. But um, even getting ahead of us, I, I want to share it real briefly. <clears throat> Excuse me. You see God, our sins, paying everyone life. So that's the first thing to sort of learn. God, our sins, paying everyone life. Kind of easy to remember that. God created us to be with him. Our sins separate us from God. Sins cannot be removed by good deeds. Paying the price for sin, Jesus died and rose again. Everyone who trusts in him alone has eternal life. And life with Jesus starts now and lasts forever. So that's our outline for the next week. Uh, I know that, that, that takes away some of the, some of the um, tension, but at the same time, it's so important that, that we understand that. And with that in mind, would you pray with me? <clears throat> Father in heaven, I pray that you, by the power of your Holy Spirit, would speak through me, in this message. We ask that your word would go forth, that anyone who has yet to proclaim Jesus as Lord would do so by faith and because of your pursuit and also because of your amazing grace, your gift of love to us. And Lord, that we would become clearer in our ability to articulate our faith. We would have a stronger sense of what you've done for us through Jesus we would draw closer to you because of the heart of, of the gospel message. And may we have a better ability to share it with others. And Lord, when necessary, we would use our words. Even this week, you would give us opportunities to share with people we love. We would invite them to church to be part of our community and, and perhaps online to watch the service with us. And we ask, be with us now. <clears throat> Speak to each one in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Jumping right in, here we see the first letter, G. God created us to be with him. In a sense, this is actually really good news, too. Even in the, in the sort of bad news, it still starts in an amazing way. We got to go all the way back to Genesis to realize just where we came from and how God put all this together. We know that he created everything. He created the universe, Genesis 1 and 2. But not only that, he created humanity, and he did so in a very special way. He created humankind, and the Bible says that he made us in his image. This is Genesis 1:27, such an important Bible verse. So God created mankind in his image, his own image, in the image of God. He created them, male and female, he created them. So when God created us, he didn't just sort of create robots. He wasn't making a science experiment. He, he wasn't just throwing some haphazard thing together. They say, hey, I wonder what will happen here. He actually created us to have fellowship with himself. And the way he did so was to make us in his image. And that means that we, in some small ways, are like God. Doesn't mean we are gods. Doesn't mean we become gods. Don't misunderstand. But to be made in God's image means we have characteristics like God. The number one thing is that we live in relationship with God and with other people, just as God does within the Trinity. He's one God, but he's God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It means that we can have the capacity to love like God does. That's a big part of being made in his image. It means that we can feel emotion and have a sense and intuition about life and understand that we are sentient beings and think about the world we can have rational thoughts it also means that we make decisions we have a will we have willpower again we're not just sort of like robots just doing whatever we're programmed god actually gave us the ability to think to, to make decisions to be rational it means that we can create god is a creative god we see that in the creation this beautiful world that he created and God made us to be creative. That's why we do creative things. We build and we, we have art and we make music and, and, and all kinds of wonderful things. That, that all comes from our relationship to our creator. And we can live forever. God made humanity to live forever. And his original purpose for Adam and Eve was, even physically, to live forever. He, they were 
uh, in their first form. They were sinless. They were, they were going to live forever. He gave them a beautiful place to live in the garden. A- and mainly he built us for relationship with himself. Th- this is how he did it through making us in his image. Now, you can think of it this way. I have um, these two bills in my pocket. <coughs> this one is, this is a big one. This is a $100 bill. And this one is a $1 bill. It's pretty similar. So these bills are pretty much the same. They, they weigh the same amount. You see they're the same size and shape. They're the same color, the same type of print, same font. Pretty much every detail on these bills is the same. The one big difference, of course, is the image. That's the big thing you see, is the image. This one has Franklin on it, and this one has Washington on it. I don't know about you, but I would always rather have some Franklins in my pocket than some Washingtons. Washingtons, nothing against him as a president, but pretty much irrelevant. You can't, like, buy a stick of gum anymore with Washington. Um, really no point to even having dollar bills in the American economy anymore. <laughs> What's the point? The point is the value is based on whose image is there. And we know that with our money. Uh, the image is everything. Who's on the image? And God says when he made you and me that we are going to be of the highest value. He is not going to stamp just any old picture on us. He is going to stamp, in a sense, himself, that we become the image bearers of God. God stamps his own image onto our souls and, in a way, makes us a little bit like him, able to have relationship with him and with each other and have immense value. And and, and this is where it starts in terms of understanding who we are and why we're here and and making this whole thing to, to make any sense at all. But it breaks down pretty quickly, and we get to the next letter, the O, which is our sins separate us from God. This is where it goes dark. We break our love relationship with our Creator. And it happens early on, before we can even barely get through the first chapters of Genesis, we see sin entering the world. And it occurs in chapter 2. Because God gave us that freedom in our will, because God didn't make us robots, because God did love us. And if you're truly loving someone, you don't coerce them or control them. You give them freedom. And that's exactly what God did for humans. He set up a system whereas we had a choice. Now, it was pretty simplistic back then. It was really only one moral choice. And we see it in Genesis 2, 16 to 17. The Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree. In the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. So God gives all the wonderful trees. He gives a garden. He gives work. He he gives um, male and female. And he he gives a relationship with himself. And it's just a beautiful world, uncorrupted by sin. But he says, I'm also going to give you one moral choice. And he makes it pretty easy, honestly. He just says this one thing. And he makes it very clear, don't take this one thing. And what happens? Well, we see the devil enters the scene. The devil comes in the form of a serpent, and he brings the very first temptation. This is Genesis 3, 1 through 4. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the other wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say... You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. So what do we see here? Well, we see the devil's bag of tricks. It's the same bag of tricks he's using today. If you've ever been tempted, you know you see the same outline today in our lives as we see originally back with Adam and Eve. And that is he twists God's word. He tries to make you believe a lie. He questions what God has already said as truth. And then he makes sin not seem so bad. Th- that's kind of his, 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 his playbook, if you will. And he makes sin seem, oh, it's not so bad. You know, look at this fruit. It looks pretty good. You won't really die. God didn't really say that. 
And the other thing I noticed the devil does here in the form of the serpent is he minimizes the consequences of the sin. God had already been clear. Look, if you eat this, you're going to die. And he, and he didn't just mean like you're going to drop dead immediately. He meant you're going to sin against me and you're going to bring death into the world in a more permanent way. And it's exactly what they did. It's exactly what happened. Uh, Eve falls for it. Adam falls for it. They end up falling for it. They, they are tempted. They're deceived. They break God's one rule. And now they've defiled the holy God. And sin enters the world and it immediately has consequences. It immediately breaks their fellowship with the with the holy loving creator and what he wanted for them and for himself. And it immediately brings sin and death and shame and guilt and pain and all of these things into the world, uh, especially the separation. What I notice when I read through that text is Adam and Eve's initial response, which we see in chapter three, verses seven to nine. It says, then the eyes of both of them were opened, but not in a good way. And they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord call, the Lord God called to the man, where are you? So they immediately do a few things. They cover up because they realize they're naked. Before it had not been an issue. There was no shame in it. Their bodies were beautiful. There was no, nothing shameful about it. But they immediately are aware of their, their bodies. They, they immediately become shamed, ashamed, and they cover up. Then they hide, like literally are trying to, to cover up and, and not have God be seeing them. And then they run away, <laughs> as if you can run away from God. Because God is still in a pursuit of humanity. And that's important here. And if you read through the entire Old Testament, this is a really truncated view of it, but you'll see that it's really a story about God, the creator, pursuing his people ever since this moment. And of course, that continues into what we'll talk about next week, the good news into the into the gospels, into the time of Jesus, the church age, all the way to today that God is still pursuing us. He's still coming after us. He still loves us. He created us for relationship with himself. But this sin really broke things. And, and we see in, in the text that they no longer want to have an, a, an intimate relationship with God. They don't want to see him. They don't want him to see them. They're, they're running. They're covering. They're hiding. A, a, and as I already said, this is what humans have been doing ever since. Did you ever notice when someone has wronged you, they won't look, you, look at you in the eyes? I mean, not usually. Not unless they're really tricky, but... I've noticed that through the years, Pe people who have wronged me, like they don't want to look at me. They will do anything to avoid me and avoid contact. That's just the way it goes. If you've broken a relationship, it's really obvious to little children because little children, they can't they can't cover that up. They don't even know they're doing it. Their body language is screaming what's happened. Hey, did you eat that cookie that I told you not to eat from the cookie jar? Well, you know, they'll look at their feet. No, I didn't do it, but they, <laughs> they won't actually look at your eyes. Anyone with little kids knows this is true. What is that? Well, it's the same thing that was going on with Adam, with Adam and Eve. It's like the sin it brings a brokenness. It separates our relationship with God and, of course, with other people. Old and New Testament teaches us. And we, we, we go inside of ourselves. We feel guilty and ashamed. We try to cover up. We try to hide. And, and everything gets broken as a result. I was thinking about this sort of current day example uh, I, I've been reading a little bit about the metaverse and all that's going on there. Facebook changing their name to Meta. And like, if you don't know, it's basically uh, trying to make a world that's augmented reality or virtual reality where you're going to wear some headsets and, and, and things on your arms and legs and so on to be able to move avatars into virtual spaces and, and really be immersed in gaming and um, getting together with other people and pretty much every aspect of life apparently is going to be affected by this probably in our lifetime. It's very interesting. I have nothing against um, technology or, or even where it's headed, but I can't help wondering if the metaverse is just one more giant attempt from humankind to hide because ultimately the goal of the metaverse is going to be to hide who I am so no one can see me and represent myself with an avatar 
any way I want. And obviously, we'll do that in a very fake way. We'll put a fake front, probably much more appealing than our actual self. And they don't have to actually see me or touch me or be near me. And I can present myself as a false self to other people. And I can control it 100%, who I'm with, where I go, and no one can actually come and have any kind of personal or even intimate relationship with the actual me. And I, again, I'm not picking on the metaverse or, or the good things that might come out of it, but I can't help wondering if that's just one more human attempt of what Adam and Eve were doing when they were covering up and hiding and, and just trying to be anonymous before the Lord. Um, it's also why so many Christians struggle having a relationship with God, even after they have accepted Christ. The number one thing people will tell me is, I, I, I know I'm supposed to read my Bible and pray, but I find that so difficult. I do pray, but it's just in passing, which of course is good before my meals or when I'm in the car, but I can't just sit down and have a quiet time the way I know I'm supposed to. And I know that, that that's the way the Bible talks about. And I know that's what Jesus did. I get so distracted. Well, to that, I find it fascinating because most of us can binge watch Netflix shows for 10 to 12 hours straight and be completely focused. But when it comes to God, we have trouble just being quiet for two minutes. What is that about? It's not really just because we have a short attention span. I think we've proven that we can, our attention span is just fine. No, it's about intimacy. It's about closeness. It's, God is scary because of my sin. I'm broken. I'm separated. But we're going to get into the good news and why that can all change next week. And that's why you really need to be a part of that. But I want you to really hear that, that sin brought terrible consequences, the chief of which is separation from our relationship with God. Now, it also brought death. It also brought uh, corruption into the world. Specifically in Genesis, it says that it made humans work really hard. Toiling the ground became really hard. It wasn't before that. Work was always a gift from God, but work became corrupted. Even pregnancy became corrupt. It became harder. Labor became harder as a consequence of sin. Everything got corrupted. The earth got corrupted. The Bible says the earth is groaning still for the second coming of the Lord to redeem it because it's going to be redeemed. This, this physical world is going to be redeemed and set right. Even the physical world is corrupted, and we feel that too. And then thirdly, the third letter is S-G-O-S, gospel. Sins cannot be removed by good deeds. One of the things I've noticed through the years, and you certainly see it in the Bible, is that humans have been trying to repair this broken relationship ever since. Even if you're not a believer, even if you're not a Christian, even if you're not in any sense religious, what I've observed, and I'm guessing you have too, and what I've experienced in, even in my own heart, is there's this sense that I need to have my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds. In virtually every religion, all the major religions, every religious thought I've ever seen or studied, and almost every philosophy of humanity, is what you're going to see is there's an approach that says, if my good deeds and my good works on, in this life, in the life that I'm given, outweigh the bad things that I do, that makes me a good person. And if I'm a good person, then I'll be accepted before God or some entity or at least be before other people. That's generally what everybody believes, except, of course, Christianity. Christianity is unique and alone in saying something the opposite, saying there's no amount of good deeds that are going to make up for the fact that we have sinned before a holy God. There's no amount of goodness that I can do to repair my relationship with God. That sounds like really, really bad news, doesn't it? But in fact, it's actually starting to hint at good news. It's actually starting to hint at being honest with our situation. Because in my view, in the Bible view, people who think they can just do good things to, to, to impress God are not being honest with the situation. Because look around, it's not getting a lot better, is it? Romans 3.23, very plain verse on this matter, says we have all sinned 
and we've all fall short of the glory of God. That's saying that every person on planet Earth is a sinner. That means we've rebelled against God actively or passively, and in most cases both. We've all made mistakes. We've all done sins. We, we've all committed even egregious acts, whether those are in our mind or in our body. We've all done things we shouldn't have done. We've all not done things that we should have done. Sins of omission, sins of commission, as they call it. We all fall far short of the standard of God, of the glory of God. There's no one that can reach the glory of God. And what's worse, Romans 6.23, the wages of that sin is death. As we already saw with the first human beings, Adam and Eve, the wages, the consequences of our sin is death. That means somebody has to die for those sins. I have to die for those sins or somebody else has to die in my place. But I can't just leave them to hope that my good deeds will be enough to somehow cover over them. God says it doesn't work like that. He's too holy. He's too righteous. He's too just. He's too big. He's too great. God just can't say that uh, the sin didn't exist. That would be untruthful. Sin did exist. The sin did break my relationship. Something has to be done to make it right because of God's righteousness and his justice. Think of it this way. I like to cook eggs every morning, part of my morning ritual. And let's say one morning you were coming over and you wanted to have breakfast with me. And I I say, hey, I'm happy to make you some eggs. I make eggs anyways. How about I make scrambled eggs? And you say, that sounds great. And so we're sitting there and you're watching me um, crack open some eggs into the bowl to mix them all up and I crack one open, you know, looks pretty good. Crack second egg open and immediately this terrible smell fills fills the air. I mean, it's bad. You you smell it from several feet away. <laughs> it's a rotten egg. It's green, it's oozing. It looks terrible. I'll be like, "Well, I, you know, I'm sorry. We had like we had snow again last weekend. I wasn't able to get fresh eggs. These are old, but it's what I have. I'm sorry. There's a rotten egg in there." You'd be like, well, I'm not eating that. So, oh, don't don't worry. I have I have more eggs in the, in my you know this is like a 12 pack. You know, I I just I'll crack some good eggs in there. So I continue on. I crack another one. It's good. I crack another one. It's good. I put several more good eggs to make up for the bad egg, and then I start whisking them all together. You know, if it's some salt and pepper. So don't worry. But all the while you're looking in that batter, and it's. It still, it smells really bad. The whole thing has turned green and you're watching me cook up these eggs. Are you going to eat the eggs? No, you're not going to eat the eggs. You're like, I'm going to get sick if I eat those eggs. That's absolutely right. One sin in our lives is enough to make us spiritually sick. One sin, just one, in my life is enough to separate me from a holy God. That's just the way it works. It isn't because he's unkind or unmerciful. We'll see next work week that he's the most merciful, the most kind, the most loving, the most generous, the most gracious. But he's also just and righteous and he cannot leave sin unpunished. So the Bible teaches and one sin separates all of that. No amount of good works is going to make it better. And if you've been trying to live life that way, I just want to warn you biblically, it's just not going to happen. And actually, you're going to end up in a new kind of bondage. Because people who try to make it to God or succeed in this life by a number of good works are like hamsters on a wheel. You're just always spinning. Because the the fear in the back of your mind is, what if I didn't do enough? How many good works is enough? How many good eggs do I have to put in in this bowl before I can make up for that bad egg? And even after we've put a few good eggs, we end up, putting another bad egg in just when we think we're getting ahead because we're all sinners, we all fall short. And that is how it's described in the Bible. Isaiah 64, 6 holds nothing back. The prophet says, all of us have become like one who is unclean. All of our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf and like the wind. Our sins sweep us away. Again, we're on the bad news. I know this, this is tough verses. This is the truth of God. This is what God says. He, he says, you know, even if you had some good eggs to, to pre- present to me, so to speak, some good deeds, to God, even those good deeds, 
acted out of our human flesh are like filthy rags. Even the goodness of our heart isn't good enough to meet God's standard. Even the best things we have to offer aren't good enough for God. They, they, they wouldn't make us holy enough. Even without our sins, we're in deep trouble before a holy and righteous God who wants to have relationship with us. He wants to love us. He wants to bring us back to himself. But that's not going to happen with all of this junk and brokenness and separateness. And here's where we end for today. And even though it's been the bad news, and I know this has some tension and it's a terrible place to stop, but I, I did that, of course, intentionally. It also points a giant arrow to the good news. I hope you can already sense that. If you're a believer, of course you can. But even if you're just kicking the tires, checking out Christianity, I think you can too. Because you can see there, there's a big arrow here toward Jesus Christ. It's a big arrow toward God's solution. It's a big arrow to, to, to why he did it the way he did it. And, and what he did is so amazing. It's so beautiful. And, and I want you to come back online or in person next week to hear about the P-E-L of the gospel, the good news, because God held nothing back. He spared nothing to love you and me and to get us out of our sin condition. But he does ask something from us, and we're going to talk about that too. So I hope that you come back. Um, and I hope that you realize that no matter where you are, God loves you. He wants to have a relationship with you. He's done everything in his power to do that. And, and all he asks in return for, is for you to, to, to receive it and, and to believe what he said is true. Let's pray together. King Jesus, we pray again for each heart leaning in. If anyone wants to accept Christ as Lord today, you would give them the gift of faith and they would call out to you and be saved. I pray that each of us would, would learn how to share your gospel message in a true and accurate way, but also in a way that's honest and full of life. We would look at people the way you do, Lord, with compassion and love as people who need your love and your relationship. And Lord, may each of us just grow in our ability to share and, and, and our ability to receive your love to us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey again, thanks church for being with us. I hope you'll check us out next week for part two. Be a part of this for, for the next week as well. And I hope that you have a great week.